Hi, I'm Kendra from Redgate's Advocate Team, and I'm going to talk about future-proofing for DevOps now and in two years. One of the things that I like to think about is actually just what is DevOps? There's a lot of definitions of DevOps out there, and I actually get asked this question fairly frequently, like how would you define DevOps? I like this definition by Ian Coldwater. Um, because I think this is a really simple definition, and I feel it really resonates with me. Uh, Ian says, DevOps is a set of ideas about how process, tools, and people can engineer software better. Right? This isn't a prescription to do certain actions. This is really a set of ideas, and this set of ideas has evolved and continues to evolve. It's key to have, in, when we're thinking about DevOps, not only tooling, right? Sometimes we kind of simplify this and we think DevOps is a pipeline. It's not just tooling or process. It's combining tooling, process, and people and figuring out how do we use all of these resources? How do we use software? How do we use workflows? How do we use creativity and people's ideas to make software better. And what we at Redgate think about a lot is specifically, how do we do this to engineer database software better? Now, as this set of ideas evolves, its name may well change. It's quite possible that in two years time, the term DevOps falls out of fashion a bit, and that is fine. We are still going to be evolving this set of ideas about how to make software better. And right now, the way we talk about that that I think is the most effective and the most exciting is DevOps, right? So our terminology does change a lot. But what we want to do today is make sure that the way that we are doing this is investing in the changes that in two years time are still going to make sense. We don't want to spend time on changes that will in two years, we'll just pivot on them and be doing something very different and the investment we made in them is wasted. So what are the things to bet on, right? This is all about prediction and on betting on the future. Well, I think these three changes are really critical to focus on. The infrastructure as code movement is, I don't think this is something that we are going to reverse on. In terms of databases, we need to modernize the way we do database development environments and move towards an infrastructure as code approach. This isn't the easiest thing to do when data is involved, but we do have ways to do this and you can make movements toward this even if you can't do this all in one fell swoop. Investing in automation and pipeline design is also I think a really safe bet that will pay off. And then communities of practice if you don't already have these in your organization, these are really an important thing that will carry on through time and will pay off in terms of helping transformation become more natural in your community and helping the practice of developing software be more rewarding for people and help people not be afraid of making changes to the database because this legacy thing of being afraid of making changes to the database is a big deal. So we're going to first talk about uh, database models and moving towards infrastructure as code. Here's a diagram of a legacy shared database model. In this model, on the left side, we have developers who have a shared development database. Now, hopefully they're using version control, but a lot of them aren't. We know from research that almost half, unfortunately, don't have databases in version control yet. And in this legacy model, uh, the developers use this shared database and then when things are ready, they push things over for operations and things get deployed by the DBA, who, who the DBA team supports the production database. This shared development database will typically be manually restored periodically, but depending on the complexity of the environment, because this might actually be a series of databases, it can be really painful and it can be difficult to refresh in a safe and secure way that, that development data set. What if, however, we could create development databases on the fly? What if every time a developer wanted to reset or generate a new code environment, they could do so and they could have their own database to work in? Well, this is attractive for a lot of reasons. The first thing is modern source control is distributed. 
For better or for worse, whether you like Git or not, it has won the source control wars. It is the most widely used repository and it's growing and growing and growing. Microsoft now recommends when you create a repository in the product formerly known as TFS, they don't recommend you create a TFS repo. They recommend you create a Git repo. And with distributed source control, you have a local repo to work in and people tend to work in feature branches. The idea of a feature branch is you have an isolated place for development where you can experiment and take your time making sure you're doing quality code because if you make a change, it doesn't, you know, if you make a change in a shared database where you change the data in a table or you change a stored procedure, well, what if your colleague needs to change the same object or run tests against that table? You've just changed it on them, right? The fact that you're in your own source control branch doesn't matter if there's a shared database. So having the ability to create these databases on the fly, it means that team members have a lot of benefit and a lot of safety and less risk in creating bugs. Overall, this means we can ship better code faster. So here's a diagram which suggests a new model for developer databases, creating them on demand with code and automation. If I can have a virtualized development database that I can create in a lightweight way, so even if there's a large image behind it, which perhaps has been sanitized from production, I can say, I'm gonna create a database associated with the branch that I'm working in, do my changes there. If things don't go well, I'll just reset the database, right? That helps me go faster. It helps give me a place where I can both experiment and make sure my code is quality. And if we're using modern SQL Server features like Query Store, I can even, if I'm doing something like performance tuning, see information about production performance in execution plans. I can get really, really rich functionality out of it. So this is the model that we want to move towards, having lightweight environments so that if someone joins our team, right, when a developer or a DBA joins our team, we want them to very, very simply be able to, with as little manual work as possible, get themselves set up with all the code locally and a development environment. So if they wanna say, hey, what if we did this? It's a simple process for them to get that done instead of having to ask, you know, hey, can we get a refresh of this? Hey, um, can I have a backup of this so I can restore it? And then waiting a long time to get the backup, to have the backup restored, all of those kinds of problems. So that's the movement towards infrastructure as code. I think that's a really very safe bet in terms of where things are going because reducing time to market, right? Reduce, being able to deploy faster and more reliably, that is key to competitiveness between industries and that's not going away. A second place that is a very good place to invest is in pipelines. And by this, it's really about designing workflows that will be reliable for you, where you're unlikely to just completely change the way you rework in two years. Now, the tooling for this is in uh, a big state of evolving, right? This is an interesting field in terms of deployment automation. It's really about the patterns that you build here more than whether you're using Octopus Deploy or Azure Release Pipelines or GitHub Actions, right? The really resilient thing here will be to learn to optimize workflows similarly for your databases in the same way you do for applications. In other words, pull request workflows have been widely embraced for applications. These are something that we should similarly embrace for databases. The way that we merge code into main lines should be similar. And we can use in here all sorts of automation that includes a nod to that infrastructure as code thing if we want to. Now, when I say on the right here, leverage the same tooling for both applications and databases, what I really mean is big picture, the same types of tooling that we interact with. So we can use work items for application development just as well as development. We can use um, 
deployment patterns, very, very similar for these. The way they actually happen behind the scenes may in some cases be different if we're deploying to uh, Azure SQL database or Amazon RDS for SQL Server, just because of what those databases allow being slightly different, but we can use the same tooling and the same patterns. So here's a simple demo of a pull request being created for a change made in SQL change automation. When this pull request is created, a branch policy says, oh, I need to kick off this pipeline for this. And this is a build pipeline. The build pipeline first runs a SQL change automation task to build this and make sure that all of my code in there can be executed successfully. It then kicks off a separate task that runs T SQL T tests and make sure that the tests that I have set up to say, okay, I wanna make sure that we're actually doing the right things in these changes, that all of these code, these tests are successful. If I wanna build on top of this as well, I can add in here. I could say after the test is complete and ours have succeeded, I could have another job follow up here, which further clones a database image to an environment and then even deploys my code to that environment so that it can be reviewed earlier. So I can have even more pipelines in here. And it's that pattern and thinking through and evolving, what is the best way that we can do this with automation? That pattern is what is really going to be resilient over time and what will that will pay off over time, right? You'll continue to incrementally involve it, evolve it, but the pattern uh, itself will uh, stay the same because it both in, it reduces manual tasks, increases speed, and it helps ensure high quality code. The third thing to invest in is communities of practice. What we see when we ask folks about what are the top obstacles to implementing DevOps, uh, there's concerns about disrupting existing workflows that's uh, in the top three. There's another concern about um, making people able to learn, right? Just upskilling. A a concerns about a lack of skills in the team is the way that that the question is worded in our survey. And this is a big this is big fear, and it has been over the four years that we've done the state of database DevOps survey at Redgate. It's hard to change. It's hard to um, learn, right? I learn and it's difficult for me. And a big tool for learning is a community of practice. This is essentially like a user group or a code club at work. And this is designed to be a grassroots thing. So you may need, a, it helps to have a sponsor. It helps to have an organizer seed this. But one of the goals for a community of practice over years is to actually have the leadership shift around from people in different teams across the organization. The idea with a community of practice is for people to share what they are doing and what they are learning. Another effect of a community of practice that is really, really helpful though is one of the things is it gives people the ability to just identify other resources in the organization. So not everyone has to reinvent the wheel. What, do, you know, I hear you're doing this. Can you give me tips on that? Like, what should I avoid? <laughs> what recommendation would you have? It also gives people different motivation as well. For effective software development these days, there's external motivators like getting paid, Right now that, that still matters. But there's also communities of practice can build intrinsic motivators, helping people be part of a community where they can share their knowledge and share their experience, helps people become more excited about working with the technology because it's not just about, you know, these extrinsic motivators, which sometimes we're like, yeah, we can give up with this, you know, okay, maybe I don't get a little bit more of a reward in this area this year, or maybe there's some other way I can get it, right? So this is especially important for databases because historically, it's really scary to work on databases. If we mess up data in databases, that can put our company out of business or cost millions of dollars, right? If that damage can't be undone. 
But this fear of making changes doesn't make us make better quality changes. We need to, to respect, you know, to understand, yes, we need to build high quality code, but we need to be able to do it in a way where we don't just shy away from doing it or try to make it someone else's job. And a community of practice helps give people a much better feeling and motivation around that, as well as having these other resources who are invaluable. Even having someone else who you can ask and say, hey, I need to make this change to a replicated table and not sure what the best way to deal with this is. Do you know? Even if the other person doesn't know, but they have ideas of who you could ask, that is so valuable. And, and those kind of connections are what communities of practice can really build and foster over time. In terms of getting these going, the biggest thing to think about is let's persevere. Not everyone's going to join in right away. You have to, when building a community of practice, establish people who are committed to, especially in the first year of the community of practice, keep inviting people, keep being open, keep sharing in a positive way what has been happening with the people who have been attending the community of practice. And with this persistence, over time, you'll find people who weren't interested at the beginning or who just didn't have enough time at the beginning or who just couldn't make it slowly start joining in. Like any community organization, you need to be persistent and open and hopeful in order to really get it to take off and to grow other leaders in your organization. Future-proofing. What are the things we talked about today? I would bet on infrastructure as code. I don't think this is going away. I think it's coming fast and furious. And moving our database development environments away from this legacy difficult to update shared database into places where people can experiment and innovate without blocking one another in a way that aligns with our use of distributed version control, very, very important. Also invest in thinking through the patterns for your continuous integration and development pipelines and your release pipelines that are promoting code quality as well as speed. Those patterns and the way that you remove manual work in there, they will really pay off as well. And finally, communities of practice and organizations, they are the new way to help people learn and help people change and also just help people have a better time at work and find work rewarding and interesting to connect people with resources that will help them evolve and to also be those resources for their colleagues. Thanks for joining me. For this talk about future-proofing and database DevOps, I'm Kendra Little from Redgate's Advocate Team. Bye, folks.